Hi. Hello. They, they were miking me. I wasn't late or anything. I, um, I'm, I'm really uh, grateful to be here. I, uh, my students, I have students who are here, so that means the world to me to have the support of my students. Thank you all so much for coming. Can I just say, I really love the fact that everybody, like every time you finish water, they bring you more water. <laughs> I just, I feel, I've never felt so hydrated. <laughs> I think the TED experience is going to clear up my skin. I, <laughs> my name is Jericho Brown, and I'm a poet, and so it, it would only be ingenuous for me to stand in front of you without uh, reciting for you a poem. Uh, where I'm from, we always begin with prayer. So, prayer of the backhanded. Not the palm, not the pear tree switch, not the broomstick, nor his closest extension cord not his braided belt, but God, bless the back of my daddy's hand, which holding nothing tightly against me and not wrapped in leather eliminated the air between itself and my cheek. Make full this dimpled cheek, unworthy of its unfisted print and forgive my forgetting the love of a hand hungry for reflex, a hand that took no thought of its target, like hail from a blind sky, involuntary, fast, but brutal in its bruising. Father, I bear the bridge of what might have been a broken nose. I lift to you what was a busted lip. Bless the boy who believes his best beatings lack intention, the mark of the beast. Bring back to life the son who glories in the sin of immediacy, calling it love. God. Save the man whose arm, like an angel's invisible wing, may fly backward in fury, whether or not his son stands near. Help me hold in place my blazing jaw, as I think to say, excuse me. The black church is a place of pageantry, of pomp and circumstance. Uh, I often think of the order of service in the same way that I think of a poem. Uh, a poem has structure, but it also has surprise. A poem has pattern, but it also has variation. Uh, the order of service was like this in that I knew that my pastor would appear when I was growing up in the church and that he would deliver a sermon to stir our hearts. But I didn't know where that sermon would come from. I didn't know what scripture he would use. I had no way of knowing what robe he would wear. Would it be the white one? with the gold buttons, or the red one with the white buttons, and the train that flowed behind him when he came up the steps of the pulpit. I knew somebody was going to shout out in praise of God, but I didn't know if it would be a man or a woman. I didn't know how loudly they might shout. All those things taught me that a spoken thing is an artful thing with highs and lows, with suspense, and yes, a moment of climax. It's those sermons that led me to think about art 
in the way I now think about art. When I was growing up, I always thought I'd get some kind of a real job and then retire early enough to pursue my dream of being a poet. That dream came from the church. That dream came from being in a place where it was required that you stand in front of people and be vulnerable to an audience, no matter how young you were, in Easter speeches and Christmas pageants and songs you sang with the choir. You had to show just how much you believed. You had to make yourself vulnerable in front of people in much the way I feel vulnerable right now in front of people. That experience is a spe an experience I will always cherish. And yet, it isn't the experience I can say I had throughout my childhood, because while it was encouraged that I speak in church, outside of church, I wasn't allowed to speak. Now, when you're a person growing up in this world, you want to express, you have to speak because you are human. And because I wasn't allowed to speak, I still had to find some way of making my thoughts and feelings known. Many of the young people I grew up with, they found crime. Uh, I never dreamed of doing such a thing because I was way too afraid of my mother and father. My mom and dad seemed to me much more violent than any police officer and being incarcerated in a prison seemed like some kind of a sanctuary in comparison to my father's belt. That's hard to believe in 2015, especially coming from the mouth of a black man. But it was my truth. My father and I have had literal fistfights over what he calls my very sinful life, so that by the time I came of age, by the time I began to write in earnest, by the time I began to take on the identity of poet, by that time, by the time I had um, had my heart broken the first time, by the time I had fallen in love with my first boyfriend, by that time, I didn't think my family really wanted to have anything to do with me. And so I didn't think I was risking anything when I made use of my own memories, of my history in my poems. So I'm going to read another poem for you again. You are not as tired of the poem as I am of the memory, a returning toothache on either side of the mouth, an ingrown hair beneath the chin, simple itch, bruising, scratch, and again, I am bundled in Cousin Kenny's clothes from last school year, my hand held by my mother's. We walk as if the house behind us isn't warm enough for my feet. In the dark, we make a few blocks around the one-story neighborhood that I loved, though nothing I've written tells you this. I want to cut it out of me because turns out it never mattered. Right now, my mother's asleep on my father's chest. His arm has landed in the same place around her most of 30 years. Give a man a minute. She's asleep, and I'm typing it all over again. Everywhere, a man is shifting a bit to make his woman more comfortable in his arms. 
I should have told you this lines ago. We walked back to the house we ran from because my mother loves her husband and his hands, even if laid heavy against her. I know you don't want to believe that, but give a man a minute. We're not done. My father loves his wife and the shape of her body, even if hunched in retreat. Their son keeping up. I'm so sick of it. Another awful father scarring this page too. A bruising scratch. We walk back through an open door. And why don't I mention how he kissed my forehead before covering me on the couch that was my bed? Listen, and you can hear them in the next room, planning names for the youngest of us, then making love loud enough for the oldest to learn. When I was a kid growing up, there, I had a dad who was capable of loving me in a tender storybook kind of a way, but he was also capable of slapping the piss out of me. And he was just like the God who had been illustrated to me as the one and only God to believe in. And that's why I don't believe in that God anymore. I have to believe in a God who is better than my dad. I get along a lot better with that God, and that God helps me to get along with the Father I still can't seem to please. Poems are mirrors of the life of the believer. Poems mirror the process of prayer. Uh, poems are infused with doubt, even at the moment of the line break. That's why they're so different from prose. You get to the end of a line in a poem, and you have no idea what's going to happen. You have no idea how to take the information you've just been given. That millisecond, that moment, where you get to the end of a line of a poem is filled with doubt. The only thing that takes us to the next line is faith. Faith that we will land on solid ground, that there will be resolution, that something in us will be fulfilled. And poems, more than anything I can think of, keep us breathing. They remind us of our own breath. When we start at the first line, and we end at the last line. In this oral art that I cherish so much, we are reminded of our own vitality. We are reminded that we live and live whole. So maybe I didn't have those parents, but I did have poetry. One last poem, Labor. I spent what light Saturday sent sweating, and I learned to cuss cutting grass for women kind enough to say they couldn't tell the damned difference between their mowed lawns and their vacuumed carpets just before handing over a $5 bill rolled tighter than a joint and asking me in to change a few light bulbs. I called those women old because they wouldn't move out of a chair without my help or walk without a hand at the base of their backs. I called them old, and they must have been. They're all dead now, dead, and in the earth I once tended. 
the loneliest people have the earth to love and not one friend their own age, only mothers to baby them and big sisters to boss them around. Women, they want to please and pray for the chance to say please to, I don't do that kind of work anymore. My job is to look at the childhood I hated and say, I once had something to do with my hands. Thank you all very much. Thank you.